We did jointly with uh, several other collaborators, uh, looking at about 27 million malware samples collected over the last half decade, and sharing some of the evolution and insights that we got from those uh, from that analysis. And so, one of the first things I want to start talking about is why we why we even went about doing this. Uh, so you'll notice you'll see that malware analysis is at the forefront of a lot of fights against internet threats, and that. Uh, dynamic malware analysis is used both by the operational and academic security communities. Uh, and in particular, uh, a lot of times we uh, take the network information derived from the dynamic analysis and we use this for threat detection, incident response, or for other indicators of compromise. And so this raises an interesting question, which is how effective is this network signal? And you know, what are the ways that we can actually reliably use this? And so I'll uh, give you a hint to some of our findings. Um, everything is fine. Uh, it's not all burning down, but there are some cautionary tales to be that we've learned from the, the insights that we got here, uh, which I'll get to later in this talk. Uh, but the first thing I want to highlight is uh, some of the data sets that we used. Uh, I'm going to call attention to a few of these uh, real quickly. Uh, the rest are explained in more detail in our paper. Um, but we, we looked at roughly 27 million malware samples collected from multiple different feeds over about a five-year period. Uh, and in this data set, there were about 7 million unique effective second-level domains that we collected uh, that we saw from this dynamic malware analysis. Uh, additionally, we had another large passive DNS data set uh, collected from a major uh, US ISP. And uh, in there, we had about 2.9 million uh, effective second-level domains that we saw uh, that were associated with malware. Uh, so one of the challenges with dealing with this much data is actually filtering out a lot of the noise. So uh, one of the things that we spent a considerable amount of time on in this work is actually figuring out how to clean up these data sets in a reliable way. Uh, so one of the things that we did was uh, there are a lot of uh, invalid domains that we see in our uh, malware data set. And so we wanted to remove NX domains, or non-existent domains that we saw being queried by uh, malware and dynamic analysis environments. And the reason why we did this is we wanted to reduce the effects of domain generation algorithms. Uh, and this, this uh, was pretty successful. We were, we were able to reduce that 6.8 million domains down to about 1.31 million domains, or effective second level domains, after we removed NX domains. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to do is, yes, we were looking at malware resolutions, uh, but uh, there's often a lot of benign traffic that's, that's uh, reached out to by malware. And so we wanted to remove popular domains in Alexa, as well as removing content delivery domains. And the reason we remove CDN domains is CDNs can be used for both good and bad behavior, but distinguishing between the two can be challenging. So we erred on the side of caution and decided to remove these CDN domains so that the, the things we had left would be more associated with malware and abusive behavior. And then the last thing was things we couldn't get out of the, with these white lists, we manually removed this uh, from a hand, hand curated list. This gave us another slight reduction down to about 1.2 million uh, E12Ds. Uh, the next thing we wanted to do was, uh, so spam is another kind of category of, of malware that we uh, sample that we saw, and we wanted to kind of filter out these types of samples. So there's a lot of work that's, a lot of great work done on spam, and uh, we didn't want the, uh, our results to be tainted by behavior that was more spam related than uh, associated with other types of malware behavior in our data set. So we removed resolutions from binaries with lots of MX lookups, um, and we removed also resolutions from things that, from domains that had mail related keywords, for example, like mail.example.com or smtp.example.com, and this gave us another nice reduction uh, down to about 329,000 effective second level domains after that. And the last thing that we filtered out is something that uh, is an interesting artifact of the underlying host operating system that uh, the malware is actually running on. And these are reverse zone delegations. So these are often things that aren't being explicitly queried by the malware, but are just an artifact of the underlying environment they're running on. And we wanted to remove these, which gave us another slight reduction down to about 327,000. So ultimately, we were able to go from about 7 million unique effective second level domains being queried by malware to about a candidate set of about 327,000 that were most likely uh, very strongly correlated with uh, uh, malware behavior. And so when we looked at uh, the, the evolution of our data set over time after doing all the filtering, uh, you'll notice that we see a consistent growth in the number of samples, number of uh, domains queried, and number of uh, IP addresses that we see. And you'll notice there's a drop in 2014. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't solve security that year. We just kind of had a collection issue with our infrastructure. Uh, and so, 
when we actually take a look at this from the perspective of what types of, of uh, malware we saw, we, we broke this into a classification between traditional malware and potentially unwanted programs. And when we look at the growth between these two different types of malware, what we see is that uh, by 2015, uh, PUP had actually overtaken uh, traditional malware in terms of the number of raw samples that we saw. Um, and this actually confirms and echoes previous work by uh, Katsias et al. Uh, that shows the same trend but on a much smaller data set. So it was nice being able to confirm these existing results with a much larger data set uh, and a much more diverse set of malware. Uh, and additionally, other work by Thomas et al. has showed that uh, Google Safe Browsing generates roughly three times as many detections for PUP as for malware. So again, this is a nice example where we were able to confirm existing results on a large data set, um, which is always great. And uh, so another thing we looked at with related to this, this kind of classification of PUP versus malware is, you know, are there differences in, in the behavior that we saw? And, Yes, there were. So one of the things that we saw was that there were actually more malware families, but the PUP families that we did see tended to have more samples per family. Uh, and this was due to greater uh, kind of binary polymorphism that we saw in these uh, PUP families, likely due to evasion of uh, AV signatures and the like. But we saw a different kind of behavior with uh, the traditional malware samples, which was even though they had fewer samples, uh, we saw that they tended to have Query more effective second level domains per sample, uh, indicating a greater, uh, what we call a domain polymorphism. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. So, what do I mean by this idea of, of domain polymorphism? So, we saw that most malware samples resolve fewer than 10 uh, unique effective second level domains. This was after doing all of our filtering. And we saw that most of those ETLDs were only queried by a single unique malware sample. So what we're seeing here is that these ETLDs aren't being reused across samples. We're seeing new effective second level domains being used in different samples. So even if a family had a lot of, of samples, you weren't likely to see the same domain reused across this. Um, and we, even further, we saw that this evasion, uh, because of this rule, this evasion didn't appear to happen on the registered domain, or it appeared to happen on the registered domain, not the fully qualified domain name. So there weren't a lot of child labels under these effective second level domains. So ultimately what we kind of were able to take away from this is that if you're, if you're taking the domains that you're receiving from these malware feed through dynamic analysis, blacklisting these domains may do little to prevent future communication with new samples. So if you have a sample today that's querying a specific domain and you put that in a blacklist and a new sample comes out tomorrow, it's likely that that domain won't be effective at preventing the future communication. And this is one of the pitfalls for using the network signal coming from uh, dynamic analysis uh, for blacklists or other sort of uh, network preventative uh, measures. And another thing that we looked at was uh, how, often do malware, how often does malware query dynamic DNS providers? And uh, this shows the top 100 pop, most popular Dyn DNS providers that we saw queried by the samples that we had in our data set. And what we saw is that Unlike the previous case with, we saw with domain polymorphism, uh, evasion here happens on the child label. So attackers don't register the effective second level domain. Usually that's owned by the Dyn DNS provider. So they'll register a label underneath that domain and that's where the evasion will happen. But this also means that you can't block that uh, effective second level domain because you might block legitimate behavior as well as uh, benign behavior. Um, so that's, that's a challenge that we have here. But one of the interesting things that we saw that uh, almost 32% of all the samples that we looked at in our study uh, made queries to uh, Dyn DNS providers. So they're heavily used for abuse by malware authors. Uh, so if you're looking for abuse, Dyn DNS is a good place to look, especially if you see uh, you know, queries coming from malware. Uh, another thing we looked at was malware querying DGA domains. Uh, now, as if you recall, in the filtering step, we mentioned we removed NX domains because of this DGA effect. We wanted to see how many uh, DGA domains we actually saw in our data set uh, before filtering and after filtering. Uh, and so to do this, uh, one of the things that we noticed was that about 12 and a half million of the malware samples contained at least an NX domain. So uh, if, we, if we didn't do the filtering, we lost being able the, the ability to look for DGA domains in those. Um, but after, we, after uh, adding some of these back in, we used the DGA archive to look at approximately 50 million uh, known DGA domains. And what we saw was that uh, before fil filtering, we saw that about three million of the almost seven million effective second level domains queried by malware um, were in DGA archive. So almost half of the domains in our data set were from DGAs. 
Uh, and even after filtering, we noticed that almost 17% of the remaining 327,000 domains uh, were in DGA archive as well. So we noticed this trend that DGAs are widely, very, very, very widely used across a lot of the malware in our sample, and that's a trend that seems to be growing. And this also has repercussions on the effectiveness of blacklisting uh, results from DGAs. Uh, and the last kind of thing we're gonna look at is uh, malware querying spam domains. We mentioned that this was a class that we filtered out because they look different. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight this last column here that shows that on average we saw these spam domains querying or spam samples querying a lot more domains than we saw after our filtering. These were querying hundreds or even thousands of domains, which was quite different behavior than we saw for things that uh, uh, were querying domains after doing our filtering. And this is kind of uh, an interesting reason why we did that. Uh, but also, the most popular spam-related sample that we saw was over a decade old, which is kind of an interesting result in and of itself because uh, this suggests that we're not doing a very good job or these things are still proliferating on the internet despite knowing about them and having you know, safeguards to protect against them. So this plot right here is, is one of the more interesting plots, and we spent a long time looking at this, uh, trying to make sense of you know, why, why some of the things we saw here uh, were the case. So what we're looking here is the network signal and where we saw it first. So did we see the network signal uh, in, uh, from a malware feed, from a public blacklist, or on the network itself? And so ideally what we'd wanna see here is that uh, from zero to the right-hand side where, the, where there are positive numbers, we'd wanna see uh, a lot more stuff there. This would indicate that we were seeing things in the malware feeds first, and then they were showing up either in public blacklist or in passive DNS list. Uh, rather, we saw this artifact here on the left, which this is the case where we saw things weeks or even months uh, on the network before we actually re received the sample and saw it from dynamic malware analysis. Uh, this, is, this is problematic because this means that there's this long window where if you're relying on the malware before you uh, take preventative measures, you have a long period of vulnerability here and you're taking a very reactive measure. Uh, and this could, be, this, this could be an artifact of the fact that, um, as we saw, uh, malware was using DynDNS providers, which they're probably long lived, uh, but there were, there were a very few number of those effective second level domains, so that shouldn't have a huge effect here, or this could be a long setup phase, or one other possibility was this could be the case where uh, malware authors are actually using domains that have maybe previously expired, and so, you know, there, this isn't an actual case of abuse happening way far in the past. This is a case where the domain was used for something else and now it was used uh, for uh, illegitimate purposes after the expiration. So we tried to account for that by taking our, a, a, a set of expired domains and looking to see whether those domains, uh, after we, we filtered and took the, the, the lasting date after the expiration, whether that changed this distribution on the left. So in figure C down here, we see that the left didn't really change, uh, which was unfortunate. That was, we were hoping that this would kind of cut that down and we'd have a, a better explanation of why this is happening. What we did see was that it did have an effect. It did push some domains uh, to the right, which meant that we saw the, the domain show up in a malware feed before we saw the new evidence of abuse happen. So that did, that did get rid of some of that, that left-hand tail, but it still existed. Uh, it was much larger than we were hoping to see. Um, and then the next thing we looked at was, um, the, you'll notice the left-hand tail on the public blacklist. This seems to indicate that, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, things aren't showing up on public blacklist uh, before they show up in, in feeds. We do see that happen sometimes, but what we see is much more prevalent is that they show up in malware feeds uh, uh, after they, they show up in the uh, PBL, or they, so we, we see that, we see the, the reverse of what we want to see there. Um, and this is actually, while this might seem odd, this is actually consistent with previous work. Um, there were people that have shown that uh, the domains seen in public blacklists uh, have shown up in DNS on average 384 days before they showed up in the PBL. Uh, we're seeing a similar thing here with, with uh, the malware feeds. Uh, and additionally, reputation systems have also been another example where this type of behavior has been seen earlier uh, than with public blacklists. Uh, and so the last thing I'm gonna look at is this kind of lifetime of domain. So uh, these show joint distributions of the lifetime and resolution frequency observed in uh, DNS for pup, malware, and unclassified domains. 
And what you'll notice is that uh, malware and the unknown class look very similar. And there are kind of three pockets here. There's the bottom left, top right, and bottom right. And these indicate that we see a lot of malware domains that are active for a short period of time and looked up fairly regularly or looked up for a long period of time uh, fairly frequently. And then the bottom right-hand corner shows that there, we see some that are looked up very infrequently over a long period of time. What's particularly interesting here is how much different that looks than the pup uh, uh, class here, which seem to be looked up fairly frequently for a fairly strong period of time. And you'll notice it's bounded between 1,000 and 1,000. Uh, and this makes sense given the fact that we saw this rise of PUP later in our data set uh, over time. So this, this uh, seems to confirm that result. And what we really see here is that all three of these plots seem to suggest that uh, a, lot of, a lot of samples actually seem to remain active on the internet for extended periods of time. So we, we need better work done to remediate these threats and get them off the, the, the network. And so some key takeaways from this work, uh, one is that there's a lot of noise in malware data sets and filtering it out can be extremely challenging. So we provide kind of a, a kind of a blueprint that other people could use to try to filter out these data sets to get to the more useful information. Um, we also saw that PUP is on the rise and it exhibits different behavior than traditional malware. And then we saw that relying on malware feeds for detection results in long windows of vulnerability and potentially limited effective instances. This is because of the things like domain polymorphism and this lag between seeing the actual abuse on the network and actually seeing, waiting for the, the binary to show up in a malware feed. So there's this long reactive delay and then the signal we're getting doesn't necessarily uh, generalize to new samples. And then lastly, uh, one of the benefits of this study was that we were able to provide independent verification of previous results uh, on a large uh, independent uh, uh, data sets that we had gathered and so this kind of just serves to further verify those results. Uh, and with that, I'll, I guess, open up for questions. We have time for one or two questions. So I'll just ask a naive question. I'm still unsure of the difference between malware and pups. Can you clarify that? Sure, yeah, so the potentially unwanted programs might incorporate uh, account for things like adware or spyware or things that don't necessarily, might have a different monetization technique than traditional malware. So they're not uh, doing the same types of things. But, so you know, you, people might have, uh, you know, spyware might, not, might be something that somebody bought and it's not something that's you know, being used by an attacker. It might be something that like, you know, your mom put on your, your, uh, <laughs> you know, your machine. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> All right, I, I have a question uh, on, the, on the delay between, uh, between observing the, uh, the network, network activity yeah. and uh, actually observing the malware samples. Uh, so you, you've, you've made some effort to, to exclude other possibilities, yeah. but uh, what, I mean, what level of certainty do you have that, uh, that this is actually, that we're observing this delay because we're, we're slow in detecting the malware versus some other possibility? Well, so the, 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 the network data sets that we were using were from a closed recursive and an ISP. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, you know, getting other network signal there by random chance is, is unusual. It would be really uh, not likely that that would be the case. Uh, so I mean, the fact that we're seeing it that much earlier indicates that we're, something is querying it. Uh, and if it's not, you know, previous uh, infrastructure that was expired and then something else happened, it suggests that it's likely of being abused by the same malware authors because there was no change in ownership between when the abuse was happening and when we're seeing the first resolutions. Uh, so that, that's a fairly strong indicator that it's, the, that it's abuse happening. Uh, why it takes us so long to get to the malware feeds it, or, you know, is, I mean, there are lots of samples out there. So you know, having one of those come in and, and make it to a feed, it kind of makes sense that that would take a while. All right, thank you. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.